We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 54 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. Today we are talking about, well, not just 10, I'm going to give you 12 tips on how to use power tools. And this is not necessarily specific to any one particular tool. But when I was going through all that data, remember several weeks ago, no, it could have been a couple months by now. I was asking you, what's your biggest challenge when it comes to power tools? And so sometimes what I like to do is go through that data, even though I have not totally collated that data. But what I like to do is go through that data and see what are the things that people are asking? What are the questions they have? What are the the fears that they have? And that was actually one of the big words that I found in that list of responses. Fear was like, out of all the responses, (laughs) fear showed up 35 times. And I believe there were 439 responses. So of those 439, fear was used 35 times scared was used 19. So I started looking at this a little bit more closely. I thought, okay, what is it that people are afraid of? I mean, it seems like it's pretty common sense. But when you break it down, there were actually three different ways that people were scared or fearful. I mean, number one is accidents, right? Like, they're not sure how to handle the tools, they're afraid of being injured. And what I saw a couple of times was, well, I'm really afraid or scared to lose an eye, finger, or limb. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I, I, even though I know that that can happen, I feel that if you know how to use power tools, if you know some basic things, those things are actually not likely to happen. And so I just started thinking, what are some ways that we could give you some tips so that when you are navigating this new world of power tools, you're much more safe. So underneath this fear, again, there was accidents. Some people were really sort of afraid of the size of tools. You know, some people said they have a lack of strength in their hands and the size of tools just make them a little afraid to use it. Again, a fear of accidents, but not just a fear of accidents, the fear because they don't know how to handle this tool. Are they going to drop it? You know, their hands are too small. They can't seem to really get a good ergonomical grasp on this tool. So they wanted to know, well, what tool should I use? I'm I'm kind of afraid to pick up this big, powerful thing. And then the third part, or I should say maybe the third pillar of this fear, scared mentality, is people are afraid to make mistakes. They do not want to mess up their project. They don't want to destroy their piece of wood. They feel that they're going to fa- fail and, and just, again, destroy their work. And because they have a lack of experience, they're not sure what to do. How do you cut this properly? What if I do it wrong and destroy my project? So those are all things that we're going to address today. Well, maybe not all of them, but we're going to address some of them. So I started thinking, what are the tips for helping people to overcome their fear of power power tools? And, you know, the thing I'd like to say is it doesn't matter what I tell you until you actually learn to use tools, which, again, my power tools course will be coming very soon. I'm I'm going to give you an update at the end of this podcast on my shed and where I stand with that. But once I get my shed done to a to a level that I feel like okay, I can kind of step back from this just a little bit and actually work on this course. That's where I'm going to be filming all the videos. So it's coming. So when you see those videos, you're going to be able to follow along and get over some of this fear, this this intimidation you have of using tools. But today I was actually thinking, what are some tips that it doesn't matter what tool you're using, these are some common things that you could start to embrace and learn about before you even pick up a tool. What are those things? So we're going to go through them today, and I believe there are 12 on my list, maybe a couple bonus ones. So let's talk about the first thing, the first tip that I have, and that tip is you should never, ever rush when you're using a tool. And 
some of these are going to seem common sense. Like you sort of know that, right? Like, oh, I should never rush because if I, if I rush, I'm going to make a mistake. But you would not believe how many times people are in the middle of a project and they just want to cut this one piece of wood real quick so they can get back to what they're doing, finish a project and be done with it. And so what happens is when you rush, everything that you've learned about safety, you just sort of throw it out the window. And that is when accidents are more likely to happen. You know, again, going back to that that term, that phrase that people were afraid of, oh, I'm afraid of losing an eye and cutting off a finger and losing a limb. Well, if you follow some of these common sense, everyday power tool usage things, it's very unlikely that these things are going to happen. So not rushing is very important because when you rush, you're going to get sloppy. So I'm going to tell you going forward, even though some of you may not have ever picked up a tool before, get into the habit of never rushing. When you pick up that tool, don't just try to make a few cuts real quick so you can go finish up this section because you have to leave. So you're going to go finish this and you're going to just make a quick, a couple of, you know, quick cuts. No, take your time, slow down and observe all the safety things that you've learned, which leads me to tip number two, always wear safety glasses. <laughs> this is something that there are times when I may skip them. Like for example, you know, I'm working on my insulation in the shed and I'm, I'm using, what am I using? Well, there was two tools that I'm using. One is a T50 heavy duty stapler by Aero Fastener, right? So I was using that to, to put up some of the things in the shed for the insulation and everything is getting covered in six mil plastic and I'm using this stapler. So I'm sweating because it's a handheld stapler and it's kind of hot in there. You know, the more you're working, it gets hot in there. So I'm rushing and I'm stapling and sometimes I would forget to put my safety glasses on. And at some point I realized, oh my gosh, Serena, why are you just using this handheld stapler? Like you need to go get your compressor, you know, get your more heavy duty stapler, plug that baby in and just keep rolling. And there were times when I would look up and I'm like, oh my goodness, wait a minute, I forgot to put my safety glasses on. So you always need to wear your safety glasses, even if you're just stapling something in, you think, oh, I'm safe. I'm just stapling. It's not a big deal. What's the likelihood that something is going to shoot back into my eye? I mean, the likelihood of it happening is very rare, right? However, that one time, you don't want to be that one case that happens out of 5,000. You always want to make sure that you're wearing your safety glasses. And sometimes you will forget. But the minute you remember, put it on. Now, you may not know this, but safety glasses actually have a rating on the glasses somewhere. It'll say Z87. Now, don't ask me exactly what Z87 means. <laughs> I don't know the technical standpoint of it. However, I did learn in carpentry class that all safety glasses that will meet, there's a certain minimum, right? Like if you were across the room and someone shoots a nail out of a nailer and it comes right towards your face, these Z97 or Z87 glasses are made to withstand something coming at your eye at that quick, that quickness. So you don't want to just be like, oh, well, I'm just wearing my glasses today. No, your regular glasses that you're using for reading or your readers or whatever it is that you're putting on your face that's not a Z87, no, you have to wear regular safety glasses. So you can find them anywhere. Just make sure it says Z87. And if you go to one of the big box stores, I can guarantee that they're all going to be Z87. Just don't go to the dollar store and buy some little cheapies that have no rating on them. So if you always wear your safety glasses, you know, that fear that people had talked about, you know, they're afraid they're going to lose an eye. It's not likely to happen because you're protected. Your eyes are protected. So wear those glasses. And here's the thing. If you, a couple tips, if you wear eyeglasses and you need to get something that's bigger, they actually do have, and I, I'd have to find some links and leave those in the com in the, the notes section, but they actually have safety glasses that can go over your normal eyeglasses. So, you know, those are good to have. And also, this is one of the things that irritates me about safety glasses. They always fog up. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm always wearing my contacts when I'm out and about and wearing a mask because they always fog up. 
Well, here's a little tip. If you didn't know, shaving cream can actually defog your glasses. So you would just put a little bit of it on there. Don't put any water, but just use a towel or cloth and work it into the glasses, clean them off, and it should have some protection for at least a little while. Now, you'll probably have to do it every so often, keep a can in there. When I was in my carpentry class, the teacher actually did have some of the Barbasol uh, cream, shaving cream there. So if our glasses fogged up, he's like, just go get the Barbasol. <laughs> you can also buy anti-fog glasses. And a couple of years ago, I had a pair from Milwaukee. Home Depot had sent it to me for like a sponsored thing that I was doing for them. And I really liked it. It, it really did work. I don't think it worked for ever because I did notice they started fogging up, but they did last for a pretty long time. But I'll leave a link down below if you want to buy those as well. But always wear your safety glasses. And here's a tip, a bonus tip. Always wear your dust mask too. This is where I failed miserably. When I first started working with power tools, I mean, I would just let whatever dust floating in the air, just I would just breathe it in. I would breathe it in. And Lord knows how much damage I probably have done to my body all, all those years when I didn't know what I was doing. I would tell you, get into the habit of wearing a dust mask, even if it seems like, okay, I've already made my cut. There's not a lot of sawdust floating in the air. I'm good. Let me take my mask off. Actually, there is a lot of small little particles of dust that you don't even see. And I know this isn't related to overcoming your fear of power tools, but this is something that's very important because every cut that you make is going to release some of that dust, the really small particles into the air. And if you don't see it, you may think you're you're safe. So for my shed, I actually had bought, I think it was by Jet. I haven't installed it yet, but it's an air purifier. So not an air purifier, it's an air filtration system. I think it was, normally it was like $500. I got it for an amazing deal on Black Friday for like $388. So it was like $100 off. And the plan is that it's going to be mounted to the ceiling up in the corner. And then all of the excess little particles that I don't see is going to be sucked up by this air filtration. So that's the plan. This thing is kind of heavy. So I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to mount this on the ceiling? I did put a ceiling receptacle outlet in the ceiling specifically for this air filtration, but we'll see. Other people have said, woodworkers have said that if you're doing some cutting and it's very, very dusty. You can take one of those box fans. I, I feel like I've told you this part before. You can take one of those box fans, the real cheap ones that you, you know, put in your, your windows or whatever, tape up a 3M. Well, I'm saying 3M. I'm thinking 3M, but you know, the air filters that you get for your HVAC system, go to that section of the big box stores, get one of those, tape it to the fan. And as you're working, as you're cutting, have that fan turned on with that uh, filter, and it'll help to to get some of those particles away from you. I mean, it's even better if, let's say you're working in your garage and you have a window in your garage, and you're let's say it's cold. You may not have the garage doors open, but you may have a window in your garage. Open that window, put the fan there with the filter on the back part, and suck out that air to go to the outside, and it's going to trap some of those particles. And I believe there was a guy who has a lathe and he does this, like he will put the box fan right at his feet with the filter and just catch some of that stuff that's, that's falling down that his air filtration system may not, may not get right away. So safety is pretty important when it comes to your lungs and your eyes. Now let's talk about your feet. Tip number three, I can guarantee you, if you are a newbie, you are probably wearing either flip-flops, sandals, maybe your favorite bunny slippers, like <laughs> we've all done it, especially newbies. You are going to walk into that garage or into your basement, wherever you're working on a project with tools, and you're probably going to just wear something that you think is acceptable. Well, here, I'm here to tell you, you will not lose or break any toes if you're wearing the right shoes. I mean, you can wear tennis shoes, but honestly, if you can get a pair of steel toe boots or a composite toe boots, those are best. And one day, this is when I was working on my closet organizer. Every day I was wearing, I was wearing my composite toe boots and nothing was happening. I'm like, 
this is great. Well, one day I decided to get a little lazy and I wore my sneakers out to the garage. Don't you know that's the day that I dropped a piece of wood on my toes? <laughs> I mean, it's like the universe just conspired to make it happen. These things happen. But it and it did hurt. I did have a little bruise on my toe. I didn't break anything. It wasn't a huge piece of wood. It was literally from probably not even a foot in the air. And I just dropped a corner of it on my toe. And I'm like, oh, man, I wasn't wearing my boots today. So this is a safety thing that you have to get into the habit of. Because if you're working with a tool, not only, again, do you want to drop, you, you don't want to drop it. People are afraid of dropping these tools because they feel that they're too big. So you want to protect your toes. You're probably not going to drop the tool. But if you do, you want to protect your toes. And if you're working with wood, anything that you can drop on your feet, you just want to make sure that you are protecting them. So that's tip number three. Tip number four, you always want to support your wood or material, whatever it is that you're cutting, you always want to support it. And this is where I think you you really don't, you don't want to play any games with this. Because the first of all, the quality of the cut that you get is going to be related to how well your wood is clamped down, right? That's number one. But also, if you think about it, you know, you've got a moving blade. And in order to prevent this, and I'm going to say wood, even though, you know, you can cut plastic and there's metal and things like that, let's just stick to wood. But whenever you're cutting wood, you know, you've got a blade that's spinning, right? You've got a blade that's spinning and that wood is going to move because the blade is spinning. So your goal is to either use clamps to clamp down that wood to a table or something that's, that's going to hold it in place. Or you're going to be able to uh, use your hand for certain for certain things, but you never want to just use your hand to clamp something down. You want to hold it, of course, but you also want to make sure that you're clamping. So let me give you an example. Uh, and there's some things that are on these tools that make it easy for you to hold these things in place. So for example, let's talk about a miter saw. And I'm going to assume that you listening to this, you know what a miter saw is. You may not have used one, but you know what it looks like, right? It's one of those tools. Usually you'll do, um, you'll have a 10 inch or a 12 inch, meaning the size of the blade is 12, 11, or sorry, 10 or 12 inches. And once you're putting your wood on the base, right, you know, right here where the cutting area is, you're usually, usually bringing that down and then cutting and lifting it back up right? So that's a miter saw. Now on a miter saw, there is a part that's called the fence. And it's a vertical part that is there to support your wood. It's there to stabilize your wood. And even though you're using your hand, of course, you're keeping your hand out of the way, all miter saws have a clamp on them. So not only are you supposed to clamp the wood down, but you're holding it against that fence. And that blade is moving in the direction I'm going to say it's clockwise, but it really depends on how you're looking at the, the miter saw. So if you're standing there with your hand on the lever about to pull it down, that blade is spinning towards you. So as that blade is coming down and cutting into your wood, it's also creating pressure on the fence. It's holding that wood in place. So not only do you have the clamp, you have your hand, and you also have the pressure from the blade that's keeping that, that piece of wood in place. So it's really impossible, as long as you've got that wood in place, it's kind of impossible for, for you to hurt yourself using a miter saw because you're doing everything proper to make sure that you, I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to do to check and make sure that you're keeping everything in place. But as long as you've got your wood in place, it's not moving, you're bringing it down in a safe manner. And we'll talk a little bit about what you do once your cut is done. We'll talk about that. But the thought of hurting yourself with a miter saw, it's your, your wood's not going to fly, to, to like fly out if you're doing these things to keep it in place. Now, the same thing with a table saw, I'll admit, and I've said this before on previous podcasts, I don't like table saws. I really don't. I feel that they're, even though, you know, they've got a fence and that's what, you know, let's say you're going to rip a piece of wood and ripping a piece of wood is when you're cutting it with the grain of the wood. Let's say you've got a piece of wood and you're going to rip that wood on the table saw. That can be relatively safe, right? But again, it's got a fence. You're making sure that your wood is stacked up against that fence. 
usually you're using some sort of boot. They call it a boot, but it's there's they've got several different ways to make sure that the pressure of that wood is on the table. You don't want that wood to come up off the table and you want to keep it against the fence, right? So even though it's there's a way to make safe cuts with a table saw, I don't personally like to use them. I don't I've got two of them. I don't use them. In fact, I'm probably going to sell both of them as soon as I clear out my cluttered garage. But that's why I use a track saw, because it's much friendlier when it comes to being able to get similar cuts without the same amount of risk. But again, the point I'm making here is that there is a fence on a table saw. So if you are mindful that you're using your fence, whether it's a table saw whether it's a circus, uh, not a circular saw, whether it's a table saw or whether it's a miter saw, if you're using your fence to make these cuts, it's a relatively safe cut. Now, there are a couple other tools that I like to use for cutting that don't have fences. What about a jigsaw? What about a circular saw? So even though they don't have fences, they do have something called a base. So just, you know, and if you want to see any of these pictures, you can go to the blog post find that link down below. But the base is the flat metal part of the tool that sits on the wood as it's being cut, right? And if you if you understand that the same rule is applying here, you've got your, your base that's sitting on the wood. You always want to make sure that your circular saw and your jigsaw are fully supported. So for example, if I'm going to do a cut with a jigsaw, I'm going to make sure that that base is sitting flat on my wood before making that cut because what it's going to allow me to do is make a safe cut and that wood and the tool is not going to flop around or jump up in my hand. So if you can remember the rule of thumb, always use your fence. And now with the circular, uh, now with the table saw, there is one time, I'm not going to get into it, but there is one time when you would not use your fence. And that's if you're doing a cross cut. Just I'm going to put it out there because because <laughs> I don't want to make a statement. Always use your fence. There is one time when you're using the table saw when you don't use your fence. Again, that's a cross cut. We're not going to talk about that. But what I want you to know is generally friends fences are your friend when you're using the miter saw and the table saw. The base plate is your friend when you're using the jigsaw and the circular saw. So you're not just going to make a cut willy nilly. That base is going to be sitting on your wood. The edge of that wood is going to be pushed up to the miter saw because you want to stabilize the wood. If you're not stabilizing the wood, what's going to happen is the minute that blade touches the wood, it's going to shake around or it's going to cause the, the tool to jump up. That's not what you want. So these are just some common things that you do no matter what tool you're using. And I think if you can understand and visualize these things, and we'll go through these in the power tools course, don't worry, we're going to go over this in more detail. And of course, I'll have video clips for you. But if you can understand that rule to always stabilize and make sure that you have your base sitting on the material material you're cutting, or have that that material pushed up against the fence, you're going to get a safe cut. It's you know, you're not going to lose an eye, lose a finger or lose a limb if you're doing these safety things. So tip number five is I usually tell people, check your blades first. Would there be any way, would there be anything in the way of you cutting? Now, blades are important when using power tools, you know, tools like the circular saw. um, You know, you can actually move your blade from like a 90 degree to a 45 degree and you can make, and you can do this with most, most tools, whether it's a table saw, whether it's a jigsaw, you can make 90 degree, 90 degree cuts. You can do a bevel cut, and that's when you slant the blade to the left or the right and make a slant uh, beveled cut. But for this tip, I'm not talking about checking the angle of your blade. I'm talking about making sure that nothing is in the way of your blade. So for example, on a jigsaw, there's a long blade that moves up and down and cuts the wood. So while that blade is going up and down while it's cutting the wood, I want to make sure that that wood is hanging off the table. Of course, it's clamped tight, so it's not moving, but there's a piece of it that's hanging off the table. And I want to make sure that my base is sitting on that wood. But when that blade goes down and starts cutting, I don't want anything underneath 
of that blade. So I'm not going to cut a piece of wood that's literally sitting on my table because the blade's going to go down and do what? It's going to hit the table, right? So you need that little bit of wood that's hanging off of the table. But you also want to make sure you're not cutting into your table. And this actually happened to me with my track saw. <laughs> I had not properly made the adjustment on the depth of the blade. And as I was cutting a piece of wood on my track saw, the blade cut into the metal of the table. Now, I noticed it right away because I started seeing little shavings of metal. And I'm like, oh, no, like I didn't want to destroy my table. It was a pretty expensive table. So I always make sure going forward that whatever I'm cutting, that there is a space underneath so that that blade isn't going to cut anything. Now, this is pretty important, too, even when you're using a power drill, you know, when you're using a drill and you're drilling into something to make a hole, let's say you're making something and you've got to drill a hole. You don't want to drill into your table. You don't want to drill into the side of your table. So you have to make sure that your wood is clamped, that that piece that you're drilling into is hanging off of the table so that you've got clearance underneath. So that's what I tell people is before you cut anything, Make sure that you know how far your blade is going to go down and that there's nothing in the way. Sometimes when I'm making cuts, depends on what I'm making, but specifically, let's, th let's take the jigsaw, for example. I love making these signs. I did one several years ago that said family. And in my kid's bedroom, I made two sign, two wooden signs with their names. And these are the kind of projects where you've got to rotate your wood a lot. It's not just one little simple cut. You know, you're doing very fancy cutouts of their names. And so you have to cut this particular area, check underneath, see where your table is. And then, you know, can you finish that cut? <laughs> if you can't, you got to undo your clamp and you got to maneuver your wood around, making sure that there's that clearance underneath. So get into the habit when you're cutting to check beforehand to make sure if I make this cut, all the way through, do I have enough space underneath to make this cut? Or do I have to make maybe partial cuts and then rotate my tape, you know, rot rotate my, my wood, and then will I be able to finish that cut? That's really important. Now, on a circular saw, you, it depends on what you're cutting. You know, you, I won't get into it too much. I will leave a link down below on how to use a circular saw. So I did a video that's on my YouTube channel. You can look at it for free. It doesn't go in total depth, but it gives you a lot of good information on how to use the circular saw, how to adjust the blade so that you're putting it at the right level. But on a circular saw, you know, depending on the thickness of your wood, you will have to adjust that blade to make sure that it fully clears the wood. So generally the rule of thumb is whatever the thickness of the material you're cutting, you want your blade on a circular saw to just come down about a quarter of an inch deeper than the depth of your wood. So for example, if I'm cutting a two by four, two by four is one and a half inch thick, not two inches, it's actually one and a half. So I'm gonna set my blade to go just right below one and a half, about a quarter of an inch. And doing that allows you to save your blade. It doesn't get really dull, you know, too soon. And also if you, if something were to happen, let's say, God forbid you're cutting and your finger gets underneath there and you're cutting with a circular saw. Well, guess what? If you only have that blade cutting out just a little bit deeper than the wood, the depth of your, your wound would not be very, very deep, right? So this is also a safety thing too. You never want to just have your blade all exposed willy nilly. <laughs> this is one thing that my carpentry teacher had taught, had, had taught me that this is, I mean, of course, I knew to only have it one quarter of an inch, but the reasoning was, number one, however you want to put it, number one or number two, number one, you don't want your blade to get dull too soon. And number two, if you only have that blade extended just a little bit past what you're cutting, it minimizes the risk of you losing a finger, which again, people are afraid to do. So I think, me personally, I think circular saws can be very safe. Again, just making sure your blade is set to the depth that you're supposed to have it set, that there's nothing underneath that could cause a problem. Now, 
I won't again go into everything about the circular saw, but I highly recommend you to watch the link down below in the show notes on how to use a circular saw. It's pretty good and it'll get you up to speed on how to, how to use that. All right. So tip number six, this is true for any tool that I've ever used. You always want to run your tools at full speed before making contact with the wood. And this can be intimidating, you know, turning a a power tool on full speed. This is exactly the hesitation that people have because they don't, they don't want to do that. They're afraid to do that. But here's what happens when you run it at full speed before you make contact with the wood. It's going so fast that when you do touch wood, when you finally make connection with the blade and the wood, you're going to get a nice smooth cut. It's not going to cause the wood to jump around out of your hands. It's not going to cause the tool to jump back in your hands. And if you're trying to cut a piece of wood and you literally have, let's say you've got a circular saw and you've got the edge of that blade sitting right there on the edge of the wood, and then you turn it on, it's going to jump. It's going to jump. And that's going to scare you. And you're going to think, oh my gosh, this is unsafe. I can't do it. No. What you do is you run your tools at full speed before making contact. And remember, a circular saw has a really wide base. That base plate is pretty wide. So when you have the edge of that tool just sitting on the edge of the board and you're about to make that cut, you turn that baby on, let it run full speed for a couple seconds, and then you make your cut, you're going to get a great cut. So remember, bring... Now this is true for miter saws. It's true for... The only thing that it wouldn't be true for is, let's say, a power drill. You know, those are the times when you might have a piece of wood, you know, on the table there, and maybe you've got some wood underneath to support it, right? Because that's usually the best way to drill holes so that you don't get all that tear out in the back. You might have a piece of scrap board underneath. But with a drill, it's best to, you know, have it there on the wood and then you can start it. But for all the other tools, run them at four, run them at full speed before making contact and it's safer. You get a better cut as well. It'll be clean, safe, and smooth. Okay. Tip number seven, keep your fingers away from the blade. Now this sounds like common sense, (laughs) but there are some rules to what you should do. For example, on a miter saw, again, picture a miter saw in your, in your mind That little, and again, if you don't have a picture of a miter saw in your mind, go to the blog post. You can see it in the blog post. But there's a little circular part there on the miter saw. That's sort of the cutting area. That's the area where you don't want your fingers to ever go into that area. So if you mind these rules of, okay, on a miter saw, this is the area that my fingers will never go near. Your fingers are not going to get cut off because your fingers will never be close enough to the blade for it to even happen. Same thing with a circular saw. I never, ever put my fingers near a circular saw blade, ever. And sometimes what happens, remember I told you before, sometimes you don't, you can't necessarily make a full cut and you might have to stop and check to see where the edge of the table is. You might have to like rotate your work or something like that. Make sure that your blade is not running when you do that. Okay. So I never leave my tool running and then look underneath the table to see where the edge of the table is. Or I always let my blade stop first before I look under or even reach under to, to see, okay. Oh, I feel the edge of the table. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. I've got a good six inches there. So if you just get into the mindset of never, ever keep your fingers or put your fingers near the blade, you're not going to cut your finger off. Now, there are, there's one time in particular where I think it can be very dangerous. And this is when you're trying to cut a part or a piece of wood that's too small, too narrow. You can't easily even stabilize it. It's, a, it's such a small piece that there's just no way that you can cut this safely. I would tell you in that case, do not make that cut. Do not make a cut for anything that's too small for you to be able to clamp it if it's too narrow, if you are trying to cut something where it's only big enough for you to hold it with your fingers, never, never, ever. So again, this is just a general rule in using any power tool. And, you know, this is one of the reason's why I love my track saw, 
because with my track saw, I can make small, slim cuts safely. And I think, I mean, you can do these same cuts on a table saw, but honestly, again, table saws are the most dangerous power tool. I won't touch them. <laughs> Maybe at one point I will use my table saw, but at this point, I am totally happy with my track saw. I do not need anything other than my track saw. And that is a, a way that I can make small cuts, slim cuts very safely. And if you want information on the track saw that I use, you can find the link down below. I do use Festool. It's very expensive. The, I believe Craig makes one that's much more affordable. And also Makita makes a track saw system. Look up either of those but it's a much safer way to get small cuts and your fingers, again, are nowhere near the blade. Tip number seven, always let the blade stop before moving the tool or the material. And I can tell you, a lot of seasoned woodworkers, a lot of seasoned contractors, they do this all the time. I see them, like when I have volunteered for Habitat for Humanity, I would see them doing it there, where they're just cutting something with a circular saw and when you release your finger from that trigger, yeah, it's not running anymore, but that blade takes a couple seconds to actually stop. So that is a very dangerous time if you're just taking your finger off the blade and then it's still rolling and you're bringing it up. I think people can get very lazy with that. So the way that I learned how to do this is whenever you're making a cut with any power tool, let that tool, let that blade fully stop before you bring it up to your starting position, before you bring it up and put it on the table, before you bring it up and grab your wood, before you stop the tool, don't reach in and try to remove little bits and pieces that have fallen away from your project. That is where people get themselves into trouble. So always remember, let the blade fully stop and then you can move the tool and move the material. I'll tell you a funny story. I may have told you this before and if I did, I'm sorry, but this is what comes to mind. There was a woman, and I'm still Facebook friends with her, but several years ago, 2016, I believe it was, I had won this contest with, I think it was like marketplace events. So I had won the opportunity to travel around the US, which was amazing. It was like on the East Coast to different home shows. And part of this home show, like, you know, tour that I was on, I got to go on to local news stations. Well, this one station in Jacksonville, Florida... <laughs> I was going to demo some of the power tools, and one of them was a jigsaw. Now, this was literally minutes before we were supposed to go on air. There was a woman who had never used, I mean, she had just, she just never used tools at all. And so I briefly showed her how to, you know, do a cut with a jigsaw. And we're going to do this on air. Oh, my goodness. I forgot to tell her, let the blade stop before bringing the tool up. You cannot believe my like just the emotion on my face. <laughs> you know, I wish I could find, you know, I'm gonna have to go back and see if I can find a link of this. She went to make this cut and it was just like a, just a regular board. I mean, it wasn't anything special, but she went to make this cut to show everybody, yeah, girl, I can use a power tool. She went to make this cut. And as soon as the material fell, she brought it up like, woo! And that blade was still running. And the look on my face, I was like, oh, you know, I'm trying to like, oh, be careful <laughs> on. I mean, we were live and I was like, oh, my God, I forgot to tell her to let the blade stop before bringing the tool up. And it was so scary that she I mean, she didn't hurt herself. Thankfully, I don't think anybody else realized that it was like a safety thing, but the look on my face, I was just deathly afraid. What if this woman had cut herself? So again, always let your blade stop. So if you're using a circular saw, a miter saw, if you're using, well, let's say a table saw, if you want to use that, a jigsaw, anything, just make your cut, let it stop, and then bring it up. <laughs> I'm having like flashbacks. That was so scary. Okay, tip number eight, always unplug or remove the battery when not in use or when changing your blades. This is something, again, that I see people doing all the time who are in the trades, who know what they're doing. They'll go to change the, the you know, the what depending on what they're cutting, they're going to go change the blade or something and the battery's still in. 
And I remember once in my class, my carpentry teacher's like, oh, you know, it's okay. It's, you know, you're not going to turn. I'm like, no, 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 no. I always unplug and I always remove the battery. So you, whether you are a seasoned DIYer and you know how to use tools, or if you are a newbie, just remember this rule. If you always remove the battery when it's not in use or when you're changing blades, you're not going to cut your fingers. You're not going to have a little child come behind you and think, oh, what, you know, look at this tool mommy and daddy were using, you know, and pull the trigger. No. So this is something that I am forever making sure that I do always removing that. And also to my brother-in-law and my niece, she's 11. In the last two months, they just moved over here from Ghana, from West Africa. That's where my husband's from. And my brother-in-law went there I guess 2007, 2008. It's a long story, but he had a child while he was over there and he brought her back and they're here now. So she likes to come into the shed to to see me when they visit during the day and I'll be in there working on the insulation and I'm, you know, I've, I've got everything just laid out on the table. Well, I realized she likes to mess with things. She likes to, she's curious. She likes to, you know, squeeze the little triggers on the window and door spray foam. <laughs> I'll be over in the corner talking to her and I just hear this and there's like a little bit seeping out and I guess she just likes it. So I realized I can't leave my tools out the way I normally do. My kids don't really come in there. She's the only one that comes in. So I have to make sure that I'm removing the batteries. I'm not leaving that there because all it takes is just one little trigger pull and something can happen. So keep that in mind. Make sure that you're always protecting the people that can come after you, but also protecting yourself whenever you just need to make a change, even with your power drill. You're not supposed to just leave the battery in there because, you know, as you're putting the the new, let's say, drill bit in there or driver, you're tightening that up. And if you accidentally accidentally hit that trigger, it's going to start spinning. So just remember, take the batteries out when you're not using this or if you're changing the blades or changing drill bits and driving bits. All right. Tip number nine, listening to the sound of the tool. Always listen to the sound of the tool. Sometimes the tool is going to just sound normal, right? Like as you get comfortable listening to what certain tools sound like, you will start to notice if something sounds off. You know, normally, like if you're using, a, let's say, a circular saw, and it just sounds like, I'm just making some noises here. <laughs> but suddenly, it just sounds more shrill, like, well, is something being pinched? Is the blade being pinched? Did you cut the side of your table? You know, that's, that's how I could tell also, when I was using my track saw, and I cut the end of my table. I mean, of course I saw the metal shavings, but it just sounded different. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what, what happened? I stopped the tool. I looked underneath. I'm like, oh shoot. So just make sure that you're listening to the sound of the tool. And if it sounds like it's under stress, then just stop and identify what the problem is. And then that's why number 10, tip number 10 is so important is avoiding distractions. Now, I'll admit, I love working and listening to podcasts and talk radio. I have been loving Crime Junkie. If any Crime Junkies are out there, definitely find the Crime Junkie podcast. I love it. I think I've literally gone through all their episodes, and there's probably 200 episodes. <laughs> I love listening to Crime crime podcasts. And also, I'll listen to 2020 and 48 Hours and all of that and Sirius XM, channel 126, Urban View, just shout out to them. But I get bored when I'm working in a quiet room. So I do keep the volume low because I do want to listen to something. But regardless of what it is that you're listening to, make sure that you're avoiding distractions. Like don't fall so much into an audiobook or so much into your podcast episode that you're not paying attention to what you're doing with your tools. So if you are a complete newbie, I would say when you are just starting out, Make sure that you're avoiding complete distractions. Don't listen to anything at all. And once you get comfortable with that tool, then maybe you can start working in some talk radio. Don't blast whatever music that's going to make you dance with your power tools in your hands. Don't do that. <laughs> Put the tools down and then dance and turn the music up. So that's tip number 10. Tip number 11 is get cozy and comfortable with the manual. They seem like they're much more intimidating than they are, but keep in mind that these manuals usually have three different languages. So the actual English part 
is not too bad. And there's a lot of good information in there. There's a lot of safety information, a lot of safety reminders, things that you may not have known about how to use this tool, but it also reminds you of what not to do. For example, I once read the manual of a power drill that I owned. I mean, a power drill. Everybody knows how to use a power drill for the most part. We don't ever think about the safety of a drill because it just seems so innocuous, right? Well, go on YouTube, look at any seasoned contractor (laughs) and how are they putting their drill bits and drivers inside? Yeah, you've seen them. They'll go, they'll, they'll, they'll hold the chuck, right? The chuck is that part that is how you're, you're tightening and loosening up the drill bits and the drill, the drivers. So they'll loosen that up by holding it tight and then pulling the trigger. So that's going to loosen it up. And then they're sticking in the drill bits and the driver bits, and then they're, they're putting it in the opposite direction and they're pulling the trigger and that's how they're tightening it. It's a, it's just a workaround that, you know, I guess for time saving sake, it's just something that they've learned over the years in their profession. Well, it specifically says in the manual, Hey, don't insert your drill bits and driver bits and tighten it up by pulling the trigger. Manually tighten the chuck. Don't use the power, you know, don't use the trigger to do that. So those kind of things where you think it's totally acceptable, but when you look at the manual, you're like, whoa, that's actually kind of risky. They're telling me not to do that. So get comfortable with reading the manual. It doesn't take a lot of time. Again, there's usually several languages in there, so it's not as thick as you think it is, but do that for every tool that you own. And then number 12, I would say number 12 is probably your most important, one of the most important. Always trust your gut. You know, there are times when I am going to make a cut and it just seems unsafe. Literally like Serena, you know, you shouldn't do this. And the minute I even tell myself that, like if my gut is telling me, girl, you need to put this tool down and walk away, (laughs) I will listen to my gut. And let me tell you, there was a time and I, I'm, Sorry if I told you this before too, but this is what comes up when I'm talking about this. There was a time years ago, I would say probably two or three summers ago, I was working on this really cool PVC garden, right? It's this little hanging garden that I made and it's, it's a great project, but it required me to cut these PVC pipes at a, at an angle, right? Like at a 45 degree angle. And there was really only one way to do it like quickly. And that was with a miter saw. Well, when the pipe was long, it wasn't a big deal, right? I'm pushing it up against, I couldn't actually clamp it down, but I was pushing it up with all my might against that fence. I brought the blade down, cut it, no problem. Well, after I cut it at 45 degrees, then I needed to make another cut at 90 degrees. Like, or was it a 90 degree cut? Or no, it might've been like two 45 degree cuts. But there was one cut in particular that was totally not safe. There was no way for me to get a good grasp on this PVC and I'm trying to push it up against that fence and I'm just holding it there, but it just didn't seem like it was very secure. My gut told me, Serena, no, no, figure out, you know, cut this by hand if you have to, get a little saw, do it that way, don't use the miter saw. And I go to pull it down and as soon as, as soon as I pulled down that blade, It just flew the thing. Remember, that blade is spinning at me. So anything that's not securely held down, it's going to fly away from me because it's going in that direction. And sure enough, the thing flew across the garage. And I just had this moment of like, oh, Serena, like you knew you were not supposed to make that cut. And of course I wasn't because I didn't have a good grasp on it. That material was not held in a way that I could safely. And it was kind of small too. So that right there told me that I didn't trust my gut. I violated tip number 12. I don't even want to say tip, rule number 12, trusting your gut. So going forward after that, uh, I, you know, thankfully I wasn't injured or anything like that. It, you know, it wasn't like my hand was close. It just flew the material. It shot it across the, you know, away from me across the garage. But what I realized is that I didn't trust my gut. So going forward, whenever I had any doubt, if, if there was any piece that I needed to cut that was a little too small where my hands might've been too close, I won't even make the cut. And so that's what I want to tell you is to trust your gut. It's, it's not bad to be fearful of power tools. 
I wouldn't even say fearful, but more respectful, right? These are tools that can do wonderful things. They can take an idea that we have in our head and turn it into something amazing. But we also have to respect that these are tools. Yes, we can hurt ourselves. But if we learn these safety things and these common ways of working with a power tool, then we're less likely to hurt ourselves. As long as we're not rushing, we're trusting our gut, we're making sure whatever we're cutting is able to be cut free and clear without anything underneath. And it's not going to flip out of our hand because we're trying to hold it down with just our hand. No, we've got it clamped and we're being safe. You're going to be so safe in using tools. You will just do the same safety things over and over and it minimizes any particular risk to yourself. And of course, you have to get to know a tool specifically, right? So that's what we're going to do in the power tools course is we will get to, we'll, we'll go through these things and you'll get to see me walking through each of these safety things, but we'll also get to know each tool. What are the tools that you need in your toolbox? If you are having a problem with finding tools that fit your hand, what are the brands that work well for you? Uh, I would say Ryobi, by the way, (laughs) just going to put that out there. Ryobi is perfect for that. But We're also going to talk about how do you not mess up your project? How do you get good quality uh, cuts? So we did talk a little bit about that in one of the previous podcasts, but again, you'll get to see all this in the Power Tools course, right? And what's going to be great is I'm going to walk you through step-by-step how to do each of these things, how to use each of these tools so that it's going to be something that we do together instead of you feeling like you're on your own. But I want you to get comfortable with these tips and understand them because it is going to be the foundation of what we do in the Power Tools course. All right, that's what I got for you today for episode 54. Be sure to follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Thrift Diving on YouTube. You can find me all those places, but you can always shoot me an email. Let me know if you've got any specific questions about how to use tools, or if you just want to give me a shout out and be like, hey, I love listening to your podcast. I listen when I'm exercising, when I'm working in the shop, whatever. I love to hear from you. Serene at thriftdiving.com. And I will see you next week for episode 55, making our way to 100. (laughs) I'll see you next episode.